This week on Act Out, tempting though it may be to ignore all things real and political for the next few days, hiding behind cranberry sauce and turkey legs won't change the ever-widening and gaping abyss before us. Dive in with us as we survey our grotesquely top-heavy economy and where people like you and I stand today. Next up, some headlines from Scotland to Syria to why oil and gas are racist. And finally, NAFTA renegotiations plus an expert take on what's to come and what we can do about it. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. Welcome to Act Out. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. I know it's the week of Thanksgiving, and you can't really be bothered to care about uh, much of anything. Your head's filled with dreams of cranberry sauce and getting sauced. You may even be thinking ahead to Small Business Saturday or Cyber Monday, perhaps. Because, hey, even we anti-capitalists enjoy a giving or getting a present from time to time. But since I'm a total downer and intrepid realist, I'm gonna go ahead and throw into sharp focus the winners of consumerist holidays, or indeed, the winners, period. And sorry to say, it's not you, and it's not me. The Institute for Policy Studies released a report earlier this month titled Billionaire Bonanza 2017. Pulling data from the 27 Forbes 400 and the Federal Reserve's 2016 Survey of Consumer Finances, the report's findings are just as disturbing as they sound. Strap in, we're about to dive headfirst into some very, very fucked facts. So first off, let's define wealth. Of course, we all have an idea of what wealth means abstractly, but what it means when dealing with specific data should be defined. Wealth essentially refers to the money left over after subtracting a family's total debt from their assets, including the value of their home, retirement savings, and other financial assets. So with that, let's take a look at wealth in the Forbes 400. In 1982, the minimum buy-in to get on the list, so to speak, was $75 million, or $189 million in today's dollars, which I think we can all agree is a shit ton of money. But that shit ton is now less than a tenth of the wealth of the poorest on today's Forbes 400 list. The minimum to, for today's buy-in is $2 billion. I'll say that again, $2 billion. That's the minimum. Ready for another figure that'll make your head spin? In 1982, the combined wealth of the Forbes 400 was 92 billion, or about 231 billion in today's dollars. That's less than the combined wealth of just the top three people on the Forbes list today. The combined wealth of the entire top 400 today adds up to 2.68 trillion, which is more than the GDP of Britain, the fifth largest economy in the world. That means that the 400 richest in the U.S. now have more wealth than the bottom 64% of Americans, or 80 million households, 204 million people. 400 equals 204 million people. Furthermore, the three richest people on the list, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Warren Buffett, now own more wealth than the entire bottom half of the American population combined. 160 million people. These numbers are ridiculous. But wait, because I'm not done yet. According to Forbes' own research, every person in the top 10 got at least $1 billion richer in the past year. And if you can believe it, a record 169 billionaires were too poor to make the cut. Just think about that sentence. I mean, I swear I'm gonna burst a goddamn blood vessel before the show is over. 169 billionaires didn't make the cut to be on the list of the 400 most ridiculously, disgustingly, horrendously wealthy people in the country. Meanwhile, one in five U.S. households, over 19%, have zero or negative net worth. Known as underwater households, they often have no savings at all or owe more than they own, which of course means that as income inequality continues to rise, there's no safety net to fall back on. Indeed, roughly 46% of Americans say that they don't have enough money to cover a $400 emergency expense. And if we look at underwater households with regards to race, we see it's even worse for black and Latino households. Over 30% of black households and 27% of Latino households have zero or negative net worth to fall back on. Meanwhile, 14% of whites live in underwater households as well. Even more stark, while white households make up 65% of the population, they own nearly 90% of wealth in America. 
Black and Latino families own less than 3% of the nation's wealth each. Less than 3%. To put it another way, the typical median white household holds $151,000 in wealth. Black and Latino households own $4,300 and $6,200 respectively. And while I'd rather not see anyone on a list of billionaires, it's worth mentioning as well that all the top 25 members of the Forbes 400 are white. And of the entire list, only two members are black and only five are Latino. 50 of the Forbes 400 are women. Now, that's not to say that all white men are rolling in dough. Indeed, if you take a look at the figures we mentioned earlier, most white men, by virtue of statistics, are in fact poor. Most people are poor. But the most poor of the poor are non-whites. Capitalism and racism are cozy bedfellows in this land of the free. And I know, I'm throwing a shit ton of numbers at you, and even as I sat researching this, I felt the need to take a break and massage my temples while screaming and burning an effigy of Jeff Bezos. But one of the things that I kept coming back to was that emergency expense number. Because I can conceive of $400. That number is actually a very real amount of money to me, and obviously to most Americans as well. And the fact that millions of Americans sit and wonder whether or not they can feed themselves, stay in their cheap apartment or even their car, pay for simple health procedures, while the wealthiest in our country made more than $1 billion in a year, it actually boggles the fucking mind. And the IPS actually notes that they're underestimating current levels of wealth concentration. As they point out, the growing use of offshore tax havens and legal trust has made the concealing of assets more widespread than ever before. So the reality of the situation is actually far worse than it seems, even though it really seems pretty damn horrendous. Income inequality continues to rise, as we've noted on this show before. And hell, even Forbes, capitalism's little darling rag, published a piece earlier this year outlining the concerns raised at the World Economic Forum, namely that the widening gap between the rich and poor has emerged as one of the biggest threats to the global economy. And that worsening income inequality can't be remedied by higher economic growth alone, and is casting doubt on the very future of capitalism. Uh, yeah, because capitalism is specifically designed to do this, to place profit above all in the interest of private enterprise ahead of those of the people. This is not news. I mean, it may be news to Ford, but for those of us not laying in a bathtub of bills, shining gold ingots with 100% cashmere cloths, this is something we've known, if not specifically, then inherently for quite some time. Past the glitter of holiday shopping, we know that there is a deep systemic rot. Beyond the Windex windows of pristine storefronts sit underpaid workers hawking slave labor threads. Behind the well-ordered syntax of industry lie chasms and gaps, a fault line, a time bomb, a capitalist disaster, a disaster capitalism cataclysm. A mathematic certainty, a burden we keep, putting off and the cost just keeps growing, like the debt clock, but here we're talking lives, we're talking death. Capitalism kills, and with each passing moment, we grow it, we own it. The light at the end of this ticker tape tunnel is dim, and the for sale sign is bright. Who's buying? Do you see the light? So as you stare down the holidays, the perfect storms of incessant ads and the programmed obligation of buying shit for people, consider where your money's going the little that we have. Because while this gross economic imbalance is made possible by legislation, deregulation, and lack of enforcement, the racket works primarily because we literally buy into it, mentally and physically. Could you make something for friends and family? Be it mittens or moonshine, something made by you is always way cooler, even if it's shittier than something in plastic packaging. Could you support a local business that has good practices? By keeping the money in your local area with your neighbors, you promote not only their business, but the wealth of the community as a whole. If you're a worker at a big box store or corporate chain, could you organize with fellow employees to stage a walkout based on livable wage and work standards? If you're creative or, you know, have some free time, could you engage in some actions that highlight the plights of workers or the gross malfeasance of the company? For example, you know, walking into the gap and asking to speak with a manager about the people who make the clothes, all the while filming. Or setting up a small table in a store like Walmart, chaining yourself to it with tape over your mouth as a commentary on the Orwellian work environments there. 
setting up a donation box outside of a store or fast food joint a la the Salvation Army, but really asking for donations for those who work there because they don't make a living wage. Or even taking some of the numbers that we mentioned earlier and making big posters or mailing letters to send to city council members or mayors, etc. The possibilities are really endless. And while the rewards won't be an overnight shift from capitalist consumerism, you may inspire some people to think twice, to do their shopping elsewhere, or indeed to hold off altogether. So instead of one-click buying, waiting in line, and mall food court cuisine, try stepping up to the holiday front lines. Before we wrap up this week, I'd like to cover a few headlines that you may have missed but need to hear about. First up, an analysis of oil and gas facilities and the communities around them found that more than one million African Americans live within a half mile of oil and natural gas wells, processing, transmission and storage facilities, not including oil refineries. And 6.7 million live in counties with refineries, potentially exposing them to an elevated risk of cancer due to toxic air emissions. The study, published by the Clean Air Task Force and the NAACP, also found that nationally, African Americans are 75% more likely than Caucasians to live in fence line communities, those next to commercial facilities whose noise, odor, traffic, or emissions directly affect the population. As Black Panther Party co-founder Huey P. Newton put it, we have two evils to kill, capitalism and racism. In related news, the Environmental Defense Fund released a study showing that just the methane emissions escaping from New Mexico's gas and oil industry are equivalent to the climate impact of approximately 12 coal-fired power plants. Fracked gas, known as a bridge fuel to those who don't understand science, is also responsible for replacing truly green energy, energy sources such as wind and solar, meaning that even plants that release relatively low amounts of methane are not in fact lowering the carbon output but increasing it. In fact, researchers confirmed in 2014 that even if methane leakage were zero percent, increased natural gas use for electricity will not substantially reduce U.S. GHG emissions and by delaying deployment of renewable energy technologies may actually exacerbate the climate change problem in the long term. At a time when fracked gas is competing with renewables to take over coal-fired plants, it's quite clear in the midst of the smog that fracked gas is only quickening our push to climate catastrophe. In a shift towards some good news, Scotland has announced that it will begin funding universal basic income experiments, asking local municipalities to create proposals for involvement in the experiment. Also in European news, German newspaper Der Tagesspiegel published the names of 33,000 refugees and migrants who died trying to reach Europe. In a statement, the paper said that it wanted to document the asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants who died since 93 as a consequence of the restrictive policies of Europe on the continent's outer borders or inside Europe. Seeing over 46 pages of names, ages, and countries of origin throws the refugee crisis into sharp focus, particularly for Germans who not only have a history of creating refugee crises, but who alternatively in the very recent past and present have taken in many hundreds of thousands of refugees, more than most other European nations, as climate change and our perpetual wars in the Middle East promote ever more instability in the regions most refugees are fleeing from, including Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Finally this week, I want to talk once more about fair trade versus free trade. You may recall from a few weeks ago that I mentioned the NAFTA renegotiation talks. Well, this week the story continues. As the fifth round of renegotiations come and go, the question is, what are they renegotiating and can you really polish a turd this massive? And to give you an idea of how massive, in 2014, Public Citizen's Global Trade Watch released a report called NAFTA at 20, outlining the effects of the trade deal between Canada, U.S., and Mexico. The findings were clear and awful. And while we'll link to the full report in our show description because it's cold, here are some key findings. A net job loss of a million U.S. jobs by 2004, which by now has obviously risen. U.S. workers without college degrees, roughly 63%, suffered a 12.2% cut in wages, although those who initially lost jobs due to NAFTA and were then rehired by 2012 experienced a pay cut of often more than 20%. 
a 239% increase in imported goods from Canada and Mexico that instead of lowering prices actually raised them by 67%. A staggering $181 billion trade deficit with Mexico and Canada, the displacement of more than a million Mexican farmers, and more than $360 million paid directly to corporations in the infamous investor dispute cases. So again, and as we noted in this show's first segment, the corporations and the already filthy rich are the ones who really win. In short, NAFTA has given us job loss, higher prices, and lower wages. So really, is it worth trying to save? Or should we focus our energies on another deal that works specifically for people and planet? For more insight, we sat down with Arthur Stimulus, Executive Director at Citizens Trade Campaign. So NAFTA is a pact that's been in place for almost a quarter century now, uh, making it easier for corporations to shift jobs to wherever <laughs> wages are the lowest, environmental regulations are the weakest. Uh, and now there's talk about you know how they're going to modernize that. Um, our coalition of labor, environmental, family farm, consumer groups, we want to see uh, NAFTA replaced with an agreement that's going to put working people and, and the planet at the center. Um, what corporations are pushing for is a modernization that consolidates their power even further, that you know extends the length of Madison patents, that further deregulates Wall Street, that makes sure that they're able to export fossil fuels at increasing rates. So with this, um, with this issue of, of modernizing it, what's at stake? I mean, because obviously we've seen what's happened with NAFTA already in terms of job loss just in the U.S. alone, not to mention the other countries involved. But so what's at stake going forward? More jobs, more economic downturn? What, what are we looking at as uh, citizens? If the corporations get their way, not only will jobs continue to be offshored, wages continue to be suppressed, um, but again, we could see uh, longer medicine patents in the intellectual property chapter. We could see more restrictions on food safety measures in what's called the, cyto, uh, the sanitary and cytosanitary chapter. We could see um, you know, further deregulation of banks, insurance companies, hedge funds under the financial services chapters. One of the things that they're talking about in the energy chapter is basically locking in uh, Mexico's privatization of the oil uh, and gas sector and, you know, making sure that they're continuing to export those products rather than using them at home. Um, so the, <laughs> there's a lot at stake here. And also the, you know, the, the issue of um, like the, the carrier plant that Trump visited and personally promised to save just fired more people uh, and shipping more jobs uh out, you know, outside the United States. And then there's obviously like the immigration impact here as well, that, uh, that you're weakening, you're weakening ec economies all over North America, thereby forcing migration. And then people come here where they expect there to be more opportunity, but because we're part of this mess, uh, there aren't those opportunities anymore. No, that's right. I mean, in the United States, we've lost, the, the federal government has certified roughly a million U.S. jobs is going to Mexico under NAFTA to take advantage of the weak labor standards, the very low poverty wages, uh, and also the ability to dump toxins in communities. So I think a lot of Americans are familiar with that aspect of NAFTA. At the same time, um, NAFTA dumped a lot of taxpayer-subsidized corn and other grains in the Mexican economy that pushed uh, at least two million farmers and farm workers off their land. They, they left the rural communities, they went to the cities, they went to the border towns looking for jobs when they couldn't find them there. You know, as you said, uh, risked their lives crossing the border, looking for opportunity in the United States. Mexican wages are actually down 9% real wages uh, today as comparison to the year before NAFTA started. So this is a pact that has been awful for working people here. It's been awful for working people in, in Canada and Mexico. Um, corporations have made big money under it. So do you feel, it, it, with all of that taken into consideration, I've seen some banners that say, you know, fix it or nix it. Do you feel that it's possible to fix something like NAFTA, or is that just trying to polish an, a, a, a really deep-rooted turd? Yeah, I mean, our coalition wants to see NAFTA replaced, uh, and we've laid out basically 10 major areas <laughs> where you know there need to be fundamental changes to the way our trading relationship works across North America. Um, I think a renegotiation, you know, in a perfect world could deliver uh, on that. And I think 
there are some areas where we're seeing some progress in the current renegotiations, but as a whole, um, you know, if you look at the three administrations, the Trump administration, the Peña Nieto administration, the Trudeau administration, um, I would argue none of them really have the interests of working people closest to their heart when they're talking about renegotiating NAFTA. And so I think it's going to require a lot more political accountability um, to prevent a bad outcome here. And what we're doing is we're pushing our demands for an after replacement. We think the further we can get those entrenched among the electorate, among members of Congress, the harder it will be uh, for these governments to pass a sham, you know, Trans-Pacific Partnership style, you know, modernization off as a new NAFTA that's going to benefit working people. And then, you know, hopefully we'll be able to kill a bad deal while at the same time at least advancing the debate on what our trade policy should look like. So it's, it's an interesting situation because unlike TPP, NAFTA is already in place. Uh, so how, and, and, and one of the arguments was that, you know, oh my gosh, we really have to care about TPP because once it passes, it's almost impossible to dismantle. How would you go about, like, what would the process be for dismantling something like NAFTA? Well, it's interesting. Under NAFTA, um, the president has unilateral authority to withdraw. So President Trump promised voters, hey, I'm going to make NAFTA much better for working people. And if I can't, I'm going to withdraw from it. Um, I think we need to be holding them accountable to that promise. I think there's a lot of uh, very justified skepticism that he's going to he's going to keep true to his word. But I think if we push him hard enough, he might just withdraw from NAFTA, and he has that unilateral power. He has to give six months notice, but then NAFTA is done. Um, there's nothing that needs to be passed by the US Congress. There's nothing other countries can say about it. He can do that. Um, and I think that's part of uh, our job as activists is making sure that you know no sort of sham modernization uh, gets him that political credit of uh, you know doing what he promised voters in, in the Midwest in particular he was gonna deliver on in terms of a NAFTA renegotiation. So in terms of, uh, you know, re replacing NAFTA, you mentioned 10, uh, 10 demands. What, what specifically are you and Citizens Trade looking for in a, in a trade deal? Yeah, so first of all, we want to see the elimination of uh, the corporate rights protections that called the Investor State Dispute Settlement, ISDS. Some of your viewers may be familiar with ISDS. But that's basically the process by which Transnational corporations can use trade agreements to attack a country's labor laws, its environmental laws, its public health laws, to say, hey, look, this is our, the violation of our rights under the trade agreement, and you have to compensate us for your, for your laws, your regulations, your court decisions. And those cases aren't heard in the U.S. court system or any other country's domestic judicial system. Instead, they're heard by a tribunal of three corporate lawyers um, who can award the, these corporations unlimited amounts of taxpayer funds, including for the loss of uh, expected future profits. So that's one thing we want to see eliminated. I think that would help um, open up a lot more public policy space, particularly in terms of climate and environmental area, but really any area of public policy. And it would remove one of the incentives corporations have to offshore jobs, they're worried that hey, if I move my jobs overseas, uh, this co you know country might pass some new law that's gonna you know mess up my business plan and cost me money. But with ISDS under NAFTA, uh, they don't have to worry about that anymore. So let's let's get rid of that provision. Let's add real for the first time, real enforceable <laughs> labor and environmental standards. There's been you know talk about that as window dressing for 25 years. Um, one of the big innovative things about our trade agreements is they actually have enforcement teeth in them when it comes to things that corporations want, like you know intellectual property. Hey, if a country is bootlegging my Hollywood movie, um, there's you know the, there's a mechanism in place whereby the corporation can issue a complaint, and you know literally billions of dollars uh, worth of penalties can be imposed until that practice is changed. Why don't we do that to end? child labor? Why don't we do that to end discrimination in the workplace? Why don't we do that to enforce some of our environmental treaties? Um, that's one of the things we want to see. And there are other areas. We want to make sure our trade agreements aren't restricting access to medicine, that they're not limiting food safety and consumer right to know measures, 
um, you know, things of that nature, the, the common sense things, really, things that, you know, should be really easy to build a consensus around. And really, I mean, we've seen, you know, voters, the public across the political spectrum, left and right, tend to agree on for the most part. Um, you know, these are the things that need to be prioritized, not making billionaires an extra billion dollars. Yeah. Right. The, the sovereignty of the people as opposed to corporate sovereignty. Exactly. So where, finally, where are we at right now and how can people uh, get involved in the fight uh, against NAFTA? Yeah, so right now we're um, at what they call the midpoint of the negotiations. Um, negotiators really want to wrap up these talks by early next year so that they can you know, push through whatever deal they come up with before the Mexican elections, where a much more progressive uh, administration is likely to come in, as well as before the U.S. congressional elections. Donald Trump is aching for a win on one of his promises. Uh, and this seems like one, you know, where he m might be able to convince voters he's he's doing things for them. Um, so they're moving forward extremely rapidly for a complex trade negotiation. Usually these things take years. They're trying to complete this in months. Um, what people can do, they can get involved. They can visit our website, citizenstrade.org. You know, we'll be continuing to organize uh, until the bitter end here to make sure that you know, that they're not getting away with a sham modernization, another TPP style trade agreement um, that either they're going to deliver real changes or <laughs> they're not going to they're not going to get away with passing something. To learn more about Citizens Trade Campaign and join the fight for fair trade over free trade, visit citizenstrade.org. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. Check out the last slide and the show description to see sites that we mentioned in this week's show. And for interim updates, please do visit us on social media. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at occupy.com slash donate. If you'd like to donate directly to Act Out, visit patreon.com slash act out. I'm not a violent man